Hey guys, remember for the Sinner, episode 2, part 2, and I was definitely really looking forward to this episode. Obviously, I loved last week's premiere. I was very surprised, uh, you know, with how in-depth it was, and just how great of a story it really told, and also how it wasn't one-sided, how it really did show everybody's side of, you know, how life was before this murder, and then how it was after, and I was very interested in seeing where this episode is going to go, and right off the bat, I'll tell you guys right now, I did not think this was nearly as strong as episode one, I thought there were a few things in here that I wasn't as happy with, but there was enough stuff in there for me to absolutely love this episode, I mean, this still was a, a tremendously well done episode, um, I thought there were some fantastic elements about it, and definitely it plays a big part in us getting to that big reveal. It definitely seems like we're going to get to that actually quite sooner than I anticipated, but I mean, they only have eight episodes, so it makes sense why not they're not rushing this story, but they're also not dragging this out either, which I'm happy about. I mean, so many of these stories, you know, they kind of drag them out, and it seems like this one, they're taking a little bit more of a faster approach, but let's just get into this, because I definitely do want to talk about this overall, and we start off right where the last episode left off, where we see Korra, and she's pleading guilty, because she knows she did wrong, and the judge asks why her lawyer's not speaking for her. The lawyer says she's actually declined her help and would rather represent herself, and the judge asks if she realizes that she's giving up the right to a trial by pleading guilty, and Cora says she knows she did it and wants it all to be over with, you know, she she in her mind feels, look, you know, the damage is done, what's done is done, and there's nothing I can do about it, and uh, the judge orders a competency evaluation before she will accept the, the plea, and that will determine if she's actually fit to stand trial, because if they can't find a motive, then there's no reason to just give her a trial, they'll just lock her up, and that'll be it. So, Mason asks Cora what she's doing, but she doesn't answer him as the bailiff takes away. So, again, that whole thing she said to him last week of just go away, I don't want to see you anymore, I want you to move on with your life. It seems like that's what she's doing. She does not want to tell him anything. She feels she's essentially ruined all their lives, and she doesn't really want him to be involved with this. So, obviously, you know, he's going to be, though, because that's her husband. So, Ambrose tells the other detectives that he called the judge before the hearing, and he made his case as to why the evaluation was needed. You know, he feels like they needed this because he's just destined to get a motive out of her. And Mason goes uh, up to one of the other officers, and we meet this character of Caitlin Sullivan. And I thought this was interesting. Basically, he knew her since high school, and uh, I didn't get the impression that they dated. I got the impression they were friends. I know some people might have thought that they dated, but I, I got it more like, no, these two are just really good friends. And he asks if she knows anything about Cora, and she simply says that she can't talk about it. Uh, you know, she can't tell him anything, just, um, you know, for reasons she will not divulge, but... Ambrose then meets with Cora and tells her that he knows that she knew Frankie, but she denies it. That like, Once again, she had no involvement in this whatsoever. They had no sort of relationship, and he asks why she won't just help herself. And if she works with her lawyer, she can deem it as temporary insanity and reduce her sentence. And he tells her that it may take a while, but eventually she could get her life back. And she says something to him that was really shocking, but she asks him what makes him think she actually wants her life back. And again, on paper, this might have sounded shocking, but... But when you really think about the way we saw things last week, it didn't particularly seem like Cora was happy in the life that she was. It always seemed like she was distracted by other things or she didn't want it or there was just this darker part of her that wasn't enjoying her life. And we go to her childhood and her father's carrying uh, her younger sister Phoebe to her own room and bed. And he yells to her mother that he needs to get his sleep. But her mother says that Cora needs her and that, you know, um... She needs him to stay with her, so her father comes to her room and undresses as the door closes, and I'm really hoping that this isn't, like, again, a raping situation. I'm hoping it's not that her father actually raped her. Um, you know, the show's kind of making it seem that way, but keep in mind, the mother's the one who orchestrated this and says, you know, she needs him to stay with her. So I, I didn't really understand if they were trying to say that, like, either he raped her or if this, you know, like it was a child abuse situation. And I'm not saying that he raped her or anything, but but the show kind of portrayed it in a certain way, and I'm hoping that it's not that. Again, I want something a little bit more interesting than that, because I've seen that story done to death, and this show is very unique in that way, and I don't want it to get into that familiar territory that I'm worried it's going to go into. But scenes like this very much do suggest that, and another scene at the end of this episode suggests that as well, and I'm really hoping that's not the case here. 
So the detectives and prosecutor meet, and they talk about the case, and basically they say that if this goes to trial, they have to find a motive, and Ambrose assures them that there's one in there somewhere, but they're slowly giving up. I mean, it doesn't seem like, you know, she'll, you know, uh, tell them anything, and it just, it doesn't seem like there's anything they can do to get something out of her, so they basically think that, you know, maybe we should just be done with this and just, you know, put her in jail, but... He speaks to Frankie's wife, Leo, to see if she can remember anything more about the murder, and she says she doesn't remember anything from that day that is helpful and didn't even notice her when she came up to them. And Ambrose asks if before all this did Frankie mention Cora's name or any other woman she may not have met, and Leah says that he only would go on about colleagues or patients he met at the hospital, but she implies that he might have been having an affair with someone she didn't know about, since most people have secrets, even the most unlikely ones. And uh, I think that kind of sums up the entire show, that all these characters really do have secrets that no one knows about, and, you know, that everyone looks at Cora to Nettie. She's this great, you know, they, they think she's this great mother, great housewife, you know, just never angry, fun to talk to, fun to be around. But there's obviously a deep emotional trauma that this one went, you know, this one went through. Under all of that, you know, happiness and all of that just, um, you know, very enthusiastic nature is a woman in pain. And it's clear that that's kind of where, what Cora was at this point and, you know, pretty much has been for her entire life. So, Basically, she talks about how uh, there, she, that he did talk about a girl that he used to have a deep connection with before they met, and there was a horrible accident that almost ruined his life, but all of this happened five to six years before they actually met, and Frankie's friends have said that he's changed since. So we don't know what this is all about, if this has anything to do with Cora, if it doesn't, but this is the only information she can give him right now. Obviously, the only thing that really ties Cora into this story is that, but... I, I don't know if that's really has anything to do with Cora. We'll have to see, but I think that definitely is very interesting um, as to, you know, what this information truly does mean um, about this case here. I think definitely that, like I said, is, is very interesting, and, and I'm definitely interested in seeing, you know, what that really all means. So, basically, um, we, what we then see is, um, after this, basically, she said, ba basically, Cora's asleep in her cell, and she has a dream of a woman asking her if she's coming. Remember, it's the same scene from last week, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna get this scene a lot, where, you know, her, there, she's asking her if she's coming or whatever, and she wakes in a fit, and Ambrose just saying in the other detective's basement, they eat breakfast, they get ready for the day, and it was a nice scene where you see, you know, he's bonding with the other detective, but Mason then goes back to work, uh, you know, you can tell he's very in short. He's really sure what he wants to do now because remember Cora just said give up your life you know give up um our marriage and just get on with your life and it's hard to do that but he does do as asked and a woman is very uncomfortable with him helping her he overhears her um tell a friend that he's very creepy so we don't entirely know what that's about if it's because of his association with Cora or if there's something more to it where the woman's just a little freaked out right now that was something that I couldn't really tell but it's clear that whatever it is, she obviously is a bit turned off. So, again, I don't know what that's all about, but we'll have to see. But the scene flashes back to Cora working as a waitress, and she's serving a drink to Mason. She was actually a new waitress who had moved recently there, and this was actually the first meeting. And he walks her home after she gets off work. And while walking, she talks about how her Aunt Margaret is the one who got her the job since she knew the owner and hired her as a favor. Now, we're going to get back to Aunt... We're going to go to Aunt Margaret again in a little bit, but he asks her why she came there, and she simply said that she just wanted to change. And again, you know, she seems like she's together. She seems like she's happy she seems like you know everything's just fine in her life but as we see in her childhood that's obviously not the case this was clearly her way of starting things over this was clearly her way of you know trying to um gain control of her life because it seemed like throughout most of her life her mother was pretty much in control of everything and this is the first time she really was in control of herself and it seemed like that's somehow Frankie uh, triggered that, I mean, triggered her back to some instance where she didn't have control, and I think that definitely is a big part of the show in general. Again, I, I keep going back to that thing of her uh, cleaning and her obsession with that. It just shows that she's not a control freak, but there are very few times where Cora really was in control of things, and this was one of the only times where that was. Once again, like I said, uh, the thing about this episode that I really didn't love comes up next because I really honestly 
don't give a shit about Ambrose and his wife's relationship problems. I don't. I don't think it's interesting. I don't think it really adds much to the story, in my opinion. But they're having a therapy session. She tells him she feels invisible to him, talks about how there was a time when she had knee replacement surgery last year, and he just left her there, and he was scared. And when she got back to the recovery room, he was home spraying his dogwood for anthracnose and <clears throat> he says the nurses had said that it would have been at least an hour before she came back out of it, and that's basically the reason um, <clears throat> why he actually did that. That's, like, his excuse, but basically, you know, he admits that it actually was a bad call, and they also hadn't had sex in very long, and she doesn't even know what he wants anymore, like, what he really wants from her, and again... I just didn't really care about this. With with a really interesting case going on, this just really stalled things. It didn't really seem like it was there to add much to Ambrose as a character. It just kind of seemed like it was there to uh, just kind of add things. And again, I feel like Ambrose, in this instance, should just be the detective. We don't really need to see much of his home life. We could just have him be the detective in the show, and that's it. I don't think he needs to play much more of a role than that, but the show seems to think so. And again... Maybe something's going to come up that makes me want to know more about his character. But so far, it just kind of seems like they're doing this just to add things to the episode that we just don't really need, in my opinion. But Cora then listens to a group of women pray in prison, and she flashes back to a group of women praying over her sister. And this was a very interesting scene. We see her and Phoebe again. Remember, the same one that got Cora that job that finally gave her that control in her life that she's very much wanted. And... Basically, she tells her she has to leave for a few days, but that they all have to pray for Phoebe, you know, Cora's little sister, and she gives her a candy bar and tells her to eat before her mother actually sees it, so it seems that Phoebe was the one person in Cora's life who actually gave her control and actually made her feel like her life amounted to something that wasn't like this religious, um, you know, zealot that her parents really seemed to be, and again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's clear that Cora really didn't, um, you know, believe in most of that stuff, and she didn't really want to do all that stuff, and she kind of was forced to follow all these things that she just didn't really believe, and it's clear that Phoebe was, like, the one person who made that so Cora didn't have to, you know, continue following all these values, and I thought that was definitely very interesting to see here. So, she puts Nina to the secret hiding place with all the other items that her aunt has given her, hoping that her mom obviously won't find it. So, Back in present time, she sits with Ambrose, he says he knows that she's not mentally ill, and he will find out why she killed Frankie, and he feels that there's someone out there who has to know something. It can't just be that this just was a random thing. You know, people like that, you know, unless she was insane, which it's clear that she's not, you know, remember, she failed all those tests that could have deemed her insane, it's clear that something was triggered in her, and there's just some sort of motive in there, so... Ambrose tells Cora her actions are hurting her family, and he will not give up until he finds out what she did, why why she did what she did, and she finally admits to him that she actually did know Frankie before the murder on July 3rd. She met him five years ago at a bar, and she thought his name was JD then, and it was the 4th of July weekend. He had pills, she and his friends actually took all the pills, and then they went to his house, and he was playing music from a band that he was in, and then they had sex, and basically... Three weeks later, she realized that she was pregnant, but she couldn't find JD. He just left, and he had her number. She, unfortunately, didn't have his, so she was hit by a car later. She lost the baby, and she tells Ambrose that she used to pray all the time when she was younger, but it really did no good. It didn't do anything for her, and... Uh, she asks what kind of God kills your baby and lets you live. So it seems that now he really does have the motive, but that might not be true as we get into a few scenes a little later on. So basically, you know, Ambrose feels like, all right, we've got it. He and the DA then watch a tape of his conversation with Cora, and the DA's happy that they now have a motive. They still don't have the reason why she killed him. Like, why would you kill them over a miscarriage? But she flashes to her childhood, and she's kneeing in the yard in the dark, praying to her sister, or praying to God, actually, that her sister is healed. And her mother comes out and says, Phoebe, remind her that Cora had been outside for over an hour, and her mother says she thinks God will answer Cora's prayers. Her mother makes Cora bury all of the little, like, trinkets and things like that that her aunt has given her, and she literally makes her bury it, like, in the dirt, and she tells Cora that even one bite of the chocolate could anger God and make him take Phoebe's life. So I thought that was very interesting that, you know, we hear her say, especially when we get to a little scene later on. Um, again, it seems like this was her mother continually having control over her, and Cora just was sick of it, but she had to just keep blindly following along here. So, 
Basically, Ambrose in the... Oh, I just read this. So basically, we then see Ambrose meets with his girlfriend and just tells her that he can't see her anymore. And again, it just... It, it shows me how pointless this plot really was. He has, try, he has to try to work it out with his wife, and I just... I don't care. I, I don't care about any of this. I don't care about her response. I don't care about him trying to work it out with his wife. It's great, but I just don't need this in the episode. You know, Mason then sits on his bed. He remembers the time that he and Cora had sex, and she acted very strangely. Almost as if she didn't want it, just like kind of how she was last week where she was very tentative about it and told him, look, you know, just, just basically just kept elongating the weight because she didn't want to for whatever reason. So it seems that Cora, she responds very harshly when she's in some sort of sexual uh, encounter, whether it's generated uh, by something she wants or not, it just seems like she is not comfortable in that situation for whatever reason. And uh, Ambrose and his wife are at their daughter's house for their grandson's birthday. He's not happy with the gift that Ambrose bought, which are binoculars, but he actually wanted Legos. And Ambrose tells his wife that it is so nice to be with her and asks her if he can come home. And she assures him that they agreed on an eight-week break. And uh, again, I just... I didn't really care much about this, but Caitlin then comes to ask Mason if Cora ever mentioned Frankie to him, but he says no, that, you know, this was nothing that he ever knew about, it just kind of happened out of nowhere, and it was simply just happenstance, that's all it was, and she then asks about JD, but he also didn't know of a JD, and he asks her to please tell him anything she might know, as he just wants some answers, and wants to stop being treated like a witness, which, you know, he's constantly been pretty much throughout this whole time. No one's told him anything. Everyone just shut him out of things. They're acting like he's guilty of something when he really is just simply, um, you know, just someone who saw what happened, which he is kind of just a witness, but he's also a lot more important than that. I mean, he's not just any witness. He is, in fact, you know, her husband. He should know a lot more details. And she says that JD and Cora had a one-night stand. He got Cora pregnant, and he sits up and tries to process this news. You know, he's never heard of this stuff before. It's, you know, she just kind of kept him in the dark about all of this, and this is really the first time any of this has really gone brought up, so again, he's kind of confused right now. So, Amerson reviews all the evidence, and he listens to the song that was playing when Cora killed Frankie and tried to think, what about this song could have gotten her to do that? So, he goes to the bar where Cora says that she met Frankie, and the waitress then remembers Cora, but doesn't remember Frankie. She says all she remembers is that both her and Cora's friend were so sauce that they couldn't even stand up straight, and there was a guy with them, but it simply wasn't JD. So, it seems that the story Cora tells does, in fact, hold merit, but this was not um, JD. This is not who this person was. Uh, Cora maybe thought it was, but it does seem that the story's telling um, actually is true. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but basically we realize that, yeah, a lot of what Cora's saying, this is not the case here. I think it does hold, like I said, hold merit in some way, but I don't think that it has anything to do, you know, with Frankie as a character. So Ambrose then decides to interview Frankie's parents, basically just to get the bottom of things, but they don't believe what Cora said at all, because Frankie's parents say that he wasn't even in the state five years ago on the 4th of July, he was actually in LA, and that his band was only a brief career decision because he was constantly occupied by things like Cornell, you know, he went to Cornell University and he had to keep going back and forth, and, uh, you know, he was always this great person, you know, even when he was younger, he always just wanted to help them, and that was it, but again, this could be the parents' just like projecting their love and admiration of Frankie onto Ambrose and that's kind of all they're doing but I, I don't think that's the case it seemed very sincere what they were saying it didn't seem like this was just them over exaggerating it sounded pretty true to me so Cora basically we realize has been lying to Ambrose she also finds out the Cora's pants are actually still alive which because of her situation, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised that she said that they weren't because I think she just wishes that they weren't because of how self-destructive they really made her and what they kind of did to her and how fucked up her childhood really was. But she's then herself, she remembers back to her childhood and her mother is then cleaning her sister's sores and her sister's crying out in pain and... Her mother tells her that Phoebe is sick simply because of Cora, like, blames this entire thing on her, even if it's not her fault, says it is, and she tells Cora to tell Phoebe what she did, and she tells her sister that she is a sinner because she took the chocolate from her aunt, and she runs out to the yard, digs up the chocolate, and then eats it, and I did not really understand why she did that, I, um, unless it was, like I said, to, you know, gain control, um, but I didn't really understand what the point of was with her eating the chocolate, I mean, I didn't really get that, um, 
But in present time, Ambrose asks Cora why she lied about her parents being dead. She says she didn't go to the hospital, and the driver of the car actually took her to her home for treatment. But again, Ambrose thinks she's full of shit. He says that he knows everything she said about Frankie was a lie, and he asks if she realizes he's trying to help her, since no one really seemed to give a damn about her. And she says that he's a detective, and he's not really supposed to be interested in that. And he says that it's simply just because it's his job. But she feels that it's a little bit more of a personal thing for him. And he asks how she knew Frankie, and she tells him the same story and he asks why she killed him and he says that she does because he knows that she doesn't get to do what she did and not know and asks what happened at the beach and reminds her the story and he starts to play the music from Frankie's band and Cora then gets agitated demands that he turn it off so again it just it ignites this fire in her and Ambrose refuses and Cora just attacks him like literally gets on top of him starts beating him and she screams that she's going to kill him the guards then come in take her away it's, it's just that bad of a situation and we see flashes of her once again, clearly having sex with a blurred figure and then running away. So again, I'm really hoping this isn't a rape situation, but things like that and then her father undressing in front of her as a child really does point to that. But I'm just hoping it's a lot worse or a different situation than what I think it is because I've just seen that story done to death. I want the show to be something a little bit different and it doesn't seem like that's really what's going to happen. Um, but we'll have to see. Mason then goes to visit Cora and tells her that he actually knew JD and asks if he heard her, and Cora will only talk about their son, but he tells her it does matter since she told the cops about it, and the world's completely turned upside down because of this. You know, he's not getting anything out of her, so he decides, all right, I'm going to get the information myself, which I thought was really smart. He goes to his friend's house, asks if he remembers a guy back then named JD, and his friend says he's actually still around. So whoever JD is, he clearly was not associated with Frankie in any way, and uh, him and his friends live up in Kingston sometimes, and Mason asks if he can help him find JD, and says it's simply just a work thing. So Mason, like I said, he's clearly going to go try to track him down, but Ambrose moves back in with his wife. They see a bird hit the window. He helps it fly away. I don't understand what the point of this scene was, uh, except to see, oh, Ambrose just helps anyone. I didn't really understand what that was, but he realizes that the bruises he has from when Cora hit him are in the exact same place at the stab wounds that Frankie has. She stabbed Frankie seven times, and she hit Ambrose seven times, and that music clearly does trigger something in her. You know, it's not just a random coincidence, and she repeated exactly what she did on the beach, and she doesn't even know it. So now he's realizing that there definitely is more of this than they think and that is the way this episode ends really great stuff overall but let's just get in this episode and where this is going to go into the rest of the season so right off the bats um as i said no i did not think this episode was as good as the first one but there was a lot of information given here uh, that still shows me how great of a show this really is and how interesting things really are here because like i said I don't think this is just a rape case. I really don't. I, I don't think... Yes, there are things that might point to that, but I just feel that this is a much deeper level of trauma than simply just, oh, she was raped and this song was played while that happened. I don't think it's that simple. I think there's more to it. In fact... I think it has less to do with the music and more the lyrics. Maybe there's something in the lyrics that really does affect her because think about it. I mean, she hears the song and it just sets her off and, you know, why, why would this song just set her off? Maybe there's something in the lyrics that points to that and I don't know what that really is all about. But the more we see of her mother, the more I think it's because she did not have any control in her life and her mother basically controlled everything that her childhood was very traumatic. Was it that her father raped her i have no idea i don't know if her father actually raped her if it was just sexual abuse if it was just like unwanted sexual contact i'm not entirely sure what it is i know those are all kind of like the same thing um but we'll, we'll have to see really what that is all about because yeah i mean i i really do want to get to the bottom of things you know what what really happened there what really caused all of this you know why did she react in the way she did it wasn't at all a normal reaction. I mean, I don't think, you know, someone who seemed to have her shit together, like Quartz and Nettie, would react away if something, unless something did happen to her. But, like I said, I do think her story actually isn't completely, you know, just, um, you know, it isn't just complete, um, just, um, you know, bullshit. I don't think it actually is. I think there actually is something more to that story. Just little morsels of things that actually do seem true. First of all, the waitress basically told the same story, that she and her friend were high, and 
that they were so sauced, you know, that they couldn't get up. They went back to the house and all that stuff kind of transpired. So maybe Frankie looked like JD. Obviously, JD's still alive. Mason knew him, so I don't really know what that's all about. I know, obviously, you know, Frankie's parents said, um, and Leah also said that, you know, Frankie's hair is blonde and that his hair doesn't look like that anymore. So I don't really know what that was really all about. Um, again, I think that they're just there's a lot more of a deeper level to this case than we really think there is. So I'm interested in getting more into that. And Mason tracking down JD automatically uh, gives him a really interesting story. It shows that he's not just going to be, you know, the husband in this situation. They're going to give him a much bigger role than that because, you know, he's determined to get answers. He wants it pronto. His entire life has pretty much been turned upside down. You know, one second he has his wife and everything's going great and they just have this fantastic life together. Yes, she may have had a few complaints here and there. Maybe there were a few times where she didn't necessarily want um, the sex or whatever. But other than that, they seem to have a pretty good life together. And it didn't really seem like any of this would really happen. I don't think you know, Mason could have ever dreamed that Cora or even thought about Cora doing something like this. Like, you know, the Cora that he knew would never have committed something like this. So what caused her to do all this? You know, he really has no idea at this point. So I'm definitely interested in seeing, you know, what this is all about, what caused her to do this. Um, cause again, you know, this isn't just something that someone does. There obviously is a reason behind it. And I'm sure, I, I do think her story does have something to do with that, but is it really what happened? I'm not entirely sure. I do think there's something she could have twisted around, but we'll have to see really where that's going to go. Like I said, the only thing that's really holding this episode back for me is a couple lines from Ambrose I just didn't really understand the point of. And also, I just don't really, frankly, care that much about Ambrose and his wife. I really don't. I don't think it adds much to the story. All it really does is give Ambrose uh, deeper layers that I really don't think he needs. I think he just needs to be the detective that is anxious to find a motive and really wants to help her. I don't think we need much more of a story than that. People vs. OJ, for example... Were those characters, you know, well-written? Yes. Were they necessarily deep characters? No, they really weren't. I mean, Johnny Cochran was simply Johnny Cochran. And yes, I mean, yes, they were based on real people, and they had to try to be as accurate as possible. I understand that. Um, I know in the night of, there was a much more personal reason for it. But I just don't think that, you know, Ambrose's wife and uh, him trying to fix their marriage and him with this other girl is really all that interesting to me. It just kind of holds things back and it just kind of bores me, honestly, when we get to it. I'm just not really into that plot line right now. I mean, Bill Pullman's so good in the show that he can pretty much do anything and it'd be great. Um, but I just don't really need that plotline going on. Uh, and then Caitlin and Mason, are we going to find out more about them? I like her character. I think their her inclusion to the show is really interesting, and it's clear that she knows Mason very well, so does that have maybe something to do with it? I don't really know. But other than that, guys, I definitely really did enjoy this episode. I'm really loving where the show is headed so far, and I'm definitely going to give The Sinner Episode 2, Part 2, a B+. Plus. So what were guys, most guys thought of this episode of The Sinner, left your thoughts on it. Are you liking the show so far? Do you like where it's headed? Or do you think it's simply just a rape case or is there more to it? That's really the main thing I want to know. Do you guys think it's just, you know, simply that it's just a rape revenge story, which I'm really hoping it's not. Again, it's not that I don't think the show could pull it off. I think they absolutely could. But I just feel like I've seen that story done to death. I want something a little bit more different and I'm hoping that we really do get into that. But that's in my review. Hope you enjoyed. Like I said, really enjoying the show so far. And I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for the series premiere of the new Netflix show, Atypical. And I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.